Good evening. Your Majesty, Empress Farah Pahlavi, and Your Majesty's Prince Reza, Princess Yasmin, Princess Noor, Iman, and Farah, Prince Ermias Haile Saleh Silasi, and Princess Saba uh, Saleh Silasi. Thank you for joining us. And of course, last but not least, Mrs. Farahnaz Pahlavi, Princess Farahnaz Pahlavi. A number of you had approached me and they, you, you asked me, why am I having this tribute event? What's the tribute all about? In the year 2001, when King Hussein died, who was the last peacemaker liaison officer between the Israelis and the Arabs, it just dawned upon me that all these men in the Middle East who gave life to peace, and then they gave their lives for peace, nobody, to, nobody thought about the wives behind those men. All these ladies who supported their husbands throughout those tumultuous years. So I said it's time that perhaps I can do something to honor women of Middle East peace legacy. That was the beginning, and that was the first time I met Her Majesty. That was in the year 2001. Growing up in Lebanon, every week we had this special magazine. And as a young girl, not that young, we always turned the pages to see what did Her Majesty do. Her hairstyle, her elegance, her involvement with all those charitable causes, with sick people, with young people, with the, with the museum, with cultural life. And uh, we were fascinated by her, by everything that she did. And for us, at that time, growing up with Empress Farah Pahlavi's all achievements, it was similar to what you were going through when you had uh, Mrs. Jackie Kennedy or for some British, Princess Diane. The first time we met, I was like a nervous wreck, but we overcame that, and since then, we have become very dear and very close friends. Right, Your Majesty? <laughs> I don't want to exaggerate. I just want to say the facts. I have admired her personally, and we're going to have a number of people who will come up and talk about her in different capacities. But before we start doing that, we have a surprise, not only for Her Majesty, but for all of you. So will you kindly open the scrolls that were on your chairs? And we're all together going to sing a song in honor of Her Majesty. And the song, which is called Tribute to Empress Pahlavi, is sung to the tune of Fiddler on the Roofs for Life. Tonight, tonight, Lechaim. Remember this tune? I would like to invite now Dr. Naira Babayan, concert pianist, who is going to be playing for us. Dear, dear Majesty, we all salute you. No, it's too high. And we're children to participate and help you celebrate your special, special tribute today. Dear Majesty, you're very distinguished. You're a woman of valor and style. Your use of skill is with the human race, charming and full of grace. Always with a smile on your face. Your kids, compatriots, and family. And, and, happy, 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 yes.
have invited a number of people to join us this evening so that they can share their experiences, their, their knowledge with the rest of us. I'm going to start by inviting a lady who has been the first woman in the Middle East and the second woman in the world who has served as Minister of Women's Affairs. She, at the present time, is the Executive Director of the Foundation for Iranian Studies, and also she's the President of the Women's Learning Partnership, an international organization that works to train women for leadership positions. And please help me welcome Mrs. Mahnaz Afkami. Good evening. Thank you, Annie, for putting together this fantastic occasion for our Queen. I want to say that it's really a wonderful but also a daunting task to speak about Empress Farah. There's so many t narratives strands in her life. There is one that is the stuff of fairy tales. The lovely young woman who was nurtured by a loving single mother, taught to, to be active and courageous, a winner in sports com competitions, a model student, soon to be swept up to a castle at the foot of the Alborz Mountains, as bride to a king who had 2,500 years of history to uphold. Another is the young woman who wished to make things, not pastries, not sauces, buildings, and she was an architect schooled at the Sorbonne who came to be in a position that she used to advantage to help save the architectural heritage of her country and positively impact its modern urban design. Both of these stories are true but not nearly adequate. The more accurate narrative is that of a modern professional woman who used the privileges of her position to make lasting contributions to every aspect of her nation's life. She founded and guided over 30 charitable and educational organizations, including orphanages, environmental initiatives, schools, libraries, festivals, and museums. One of the museums she founded, the Tehran Museum of Modern Art, recently opened after 30 years of being shut. It contains the greatest collection of Western modern art outside Europe and the United States. We have in this room several of the people who enjoyed her thoughtful and sustained support in her innovative and important work. Dr. Leila Deba, who helped create the Negaristan Museum, a beautiful treasure trove of Qajar art, and Dr. Feridun Allah, who founded the first national blood transfusion service. It takes volumes to describe all that Queen Farah did for her country and the impact she had on Iran as a working queen, as a role model who combined the best of our cultures and traditions of family and community cohesion with the responsibilities and contributions of a professional modern woman. I think it best to use the few minutes I have to tell you about her by giving you a few short glimpses of my own first-hand experience traveling with her throughout Iran. Imagine a small town at the age, edge of the desert where we sat in the mayor's living room with windows opening to the beautiful mountains in the distance. The mayor spread the blueprint on the table in front of the queen, showing what he proposed to build at the center of the city. A huge, tall monument that dwarfed the greenery and trees around, around it and blocked the view of the mountains. She smiles and said, this looks good. Perhaps it could be a little lower. The mayor penciled in a cut at the top. The queen said, perhaps even a little lower. <laughs> the, the guy cut some more. The queen, queen said, this is much better. 
but maybe even a little more like this. And she t picked up the pencil from the table and just cut down that whole uh, uh, monument. And this was quite reasonable by now. The city had its view of the mountain, and the mayor never tried, tired of describing how graciously the queen participated in designing his monument. <laughs> <laughs> she was in her 30s, uh, full of energy, positive, thoughtful, always learning from the traditional older men and women who were managing various institutions in the country, as well as the best of the dynamic young thinkers and artists. Her conversation was lively and new, but most of all, she was as joyful as her name, Farah, meaning joy. On that same trip, where she managed to cut the mayor's monument in half without alienating him, we were driving to the hotel in the moonlight. One could actually read by the light of the full moon in the clear desert air. We stopped so we could walk for a few minutes. As we strolled, we saw a truck coming towards us. The truck driver stopped for several minutes, took a good look as we approached him, and then zoomed by. Queen Farah laughed and said, now this fellow will go home to his wife. He will say, guess what I saw? The queen walking with a couple of people in the middle of the road outside the city. And the wife would say, sure, of course. You just saw the queen walking in the desert. What else is new? Your supper is in the next room. <laughs> she was the people's queen and they loved her. On another trip, riding in a helicopter, she noticed a small body of water below. She asked the name and no one knew. She told the pilot to land so she could see what recreational possibilities there might be for that area. A group of local villagers saw the helicopter and surmised that it must be someone important. Once they saw it was the queen, they ran to us and pressed close, wanting to hug her. We formed a protective circle around her, holding hands. A village woman kept kissing my arm up and down and saying, you're next to her, pass it on. <laughs> her support of the arts, in effect, began a modern renaissance in the country. The annual Shiraz Arts Festival remains a unique international event that has not been replicated in sp scope and variety. It was a meeting place that allowed interaction between the best of the arts around the globe, both in the array of the genres of the art presented and the opportunity for Iranian and international artists to interact and innovate together. Maurice Bejar created a ballet on the themes from the classical Iranian poet Saadi. The performance under the lighted columns of the ancient palace in Persopolis was magical. Shiraz was where Peter Brook's ultra-modern plays, Japanese no-dramas, the Indian Katakali, and the Iranian folk tra tragedies Tazir were experienced within the same season, refreshing the traditional, celebrating the classical, nurturing the experimental, and stimulating a dialogue across generations, cultures, and languages. University sends busloads of students to experience the arts of East and West, and international artists became familiar with Iranian art and with other artists from all, all far-off regions. Queen Farah assembled a brilliant team to organize the festival. Uh, one of them was Reza Qutbi. He and his uh, wonderful wife, who was a violinist, had an important role but the soul of the festival and the energy behind it belonged to Queen Farah. On every one of her frequent listening tours, she made, she made sure to visit the women's organization centers that were located in the poorest parts of the cities in order to help bring skills from literacy to carpet weaving to repair of electrical appliances to allow women to become independent, but more important, to raise consciousness and to help them become self-reliant. 
She also always visited one of the libraries of the Center for the Intellectual Development of Children and Young Adults that she had founded. These libraries were not only a rich resource for communities around the country, but since they produced ch children's books and films, they became a training center for the future graphic designers, writers, and directors who became international prize winners. Among them, our beloved director, the late Abbas Kiarostami. The center held an international festival that helped Iranian artists to interact and exchange knowledge with their counterparts abroad. On, on one of the Queen's visits to a small town in the southern province of Khuzestan, she toured the children's library and spoke with children and adolescents who were taking, taking classes. She asked the 12-year-old girl, how do you like your new library? The girl looked up from her drawing and smiled and said, it's great, but we don't have cinematography. <laughs> Sometimes when I think of that ambitious, brilliant young girl and imagine how the world closed in on her after the revolution and, and the opportunities lost to her, I remember young women like Samira Mahmalbov, who despite all limitations became a prize-winning film director in her 20s and a host of other artists, writers, businesswomen, and men and entrepreneurs who are overcoming horrendous obstacles to realize their talents. The Queen's work and her service based on love of her people and her country lives in these women and men decades later as our esteemed and courageous poet Simine Behbahani has written, and I'll quote, let green spring burst forth let green flora come alive. Let joy, Farah, fill the heart of all who are grieved by this morbid, ashen fall. Thank you, Your Majesty, for all you have done. Thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure now to introduce Prince Reza Pahlavi. Prince, you may come step this way if you would like. <laughs> who is the eldest son and heir to the throne. For the past 37 years, Prince Reza has been working nonstop to bring about secular democracy as well as human rights in Iran. And he's been heavily involved. Yes, let's give him a round of applause. And he has not stopped doing this by working with several organizations as well as civil rights activists. Now let me introduce Princess Yasmin, the Empress's daughter-in-law. She is a beauty. I'm in love with her. She is the mother of the Empress's three lovely granddaughters. She is a lawyer by profession and she is also an activist on children's issues and rights as well. And here comes the gorgeous three grandchildren. Princess Noor, who graduated from Georgetown University. She works and lives in New York in commercial real estate investments and developments. She is also very active with uh, humanitarian causes and she works with an organization called Acumen. The next author is Iman. Iman is a graduate from Michigan University and she is a digital media expert and she's working for a special account for BMW. And here comes the youngest one, Farah, named after her grandma. Not only she is named after her grandma, but she has inherited the, uh, let's say, the sports uh, athletic talents of her grandma because she loves to ride horses, ski, scuba dive, uh, play lacrosse and many many other things. So now ladies and gentlemen, here is the family and they're gonna each one say a few words to us. Thank you so much. Good evening everyone. When we think of the word mother, what comes to, what comes to mind? the gentle touch of a smiling face who unconditionally is there for you. The one who is, throughout your life, an element of support and stability. And yes, far too often, a source of inspiration. But what happens when you have to share this person with millions of people? <laughs> my mother has been much more than one to myself and my siblings. 
She has been a mother to generations of Iranians. Even today, for tens of millions of young Iranians who never lived during her reign, she is perceived as a mother figure. Her legacy is now etched in stone. In this short time, all I can say is that despite all the hardship and tumultuous events and tragedies in her life, she has managed to maintain her strength, courage, and above all, her dignity. So people always ask me if I know how great my grandmother is. There are three people I genuinely believe are angels. My dad, Amifaranos, and my grandmother. When I see my dad and Amme, I often think, you are so deeply good, how could the world leave you intact? It's as though they fell out of the sky and were not wired like other humans. Having angels like this in your family with not a manipulative or bad bone in their body is a recipe for anxiety and overprotectiveness. <laughs> Luckily, I also have a third and different kind of angel in my family, my grandmother. And she is a constant source of calm and peace. As her granddaughter, I've spent a lot of time with her and can thus recognize the signs that she is, in fact, superhuman. She is kind to all living things. She never kills bugs, only moves them, always concerned that we will scare them. <laughs> When Iman and I were little, she would take us walking outside in her garden at her house in Greenwich. Um, and we would visit all of the trees, hug them, thank them, respect them. <laughs> this has stayed with me. It's a really useful skill being able to draw strength from trees. <laughs> my mama Ayat is essential to who I am and who I hope to become. She is central to all my earliest memories. And she is the one force of consistency in my life, con con consistent joy, love, and inspiration. So to those who ask me if I know how great my grandmother is, I would say this. I definitely noticed, <laughs> and I certainly understand the unique privilege it is to be shaped by someone so fundamentally pure, intelligent, kind, selfless, and wise. I don't know who I would be without her. My grandma is such an inspiration to me, Nora, and Fata, as she is to us all. Not only is she always there for us to lean on and to dispense her wisdom, she has also taught us by example what strength really is. She has suffered more tragedies and life upheavals than anyone I know. One would have expected her to have become bitter to life or resentful. However, as we all know, she is the complete opposite, a true example of quiet, enduring strength. She spends her days and nights getting lost in her thoughts about Iran and how to help her people find liberty and happiness. She dedicates her days to writing emails and making surprise phone calls to people who are overjoyed to hear her voice. You can tell that being in touch with her people gives her so much happiness. I remember one time in Montgomery Mall, we were stopped by a kind woman who was in tears when she saw my grandmother. Of course, my grandmother immediately embraced her, shared stories with her, and at the end agreed to basically have a photo shoot in the middle of Nordstrom's with her. <laughs> Once we walked away, I asked her if it bothered her when she gets stopped by people in public. And she, immediately she looked back and said, absolutely not. This gives me the most joy in life and gives me the energy to keep going. My grandma represents grace, humility, empathy, dignity, like no one else in the world. She really is my biggest role model in every way, and I can't imagine where I'd be without all her love and caring attention through life. I became a part of your family at the age of 17. I've therefore had the good fortune and privilege to have had you as a mother figure for over 31 years. I could speak for hours about what you have meant to me, but of course this forum doesn't allow for that. So instead, I want to thank you for showing me that one doesn't need money, a crown, or a throne to be a queen. You're always kind, gracious, and respectful, no matter the occasion. You've helped me raise my daughters into the fine women they've become. You've always made time to love them, to nurture them, and to help them in all aspects of their lives. It might sound like a strange thing to say, but I think Reza, the girls, and I owe a thanks of sorts to the Islamic fundamentalists who changed the direction of your life. Iran's loss is our gain. 
We are indeed so lucky to have had the full force of your love and affection, for which I am eternally grateful. Reza, Yasmin, Noor, Iman, and Farah, your stories, your remarks were so moving, so from the bottom of your hearts. Thank you very much for letting us into your lives and sharing with us your love and everything that you have learned from your grandma. I also wanted to invite an expat, Iranian. Her name is Nazanin Bonyadi. Some of you may know her. She was born during the revolution and uh, her parents moved to London and then to the States. She is an activist as well as a British American actress. She is also with Amnesty International, so I would like to invite Ms. Nazanin Bonyadi to share with us her experiences of growing up in the United States as an expat. As a woman, as an artist, as an activist, and as an Iranian, I have many reasons to feel indebted to the Empress Farah Pahlavi. As a fan of Abbas Kurostami, I was moved to learn that long before he became Iran's first world-renowned filmmaker, he got his start at Kanun, a government-funded organization created by the Empress to encourage the intellectual development of children and young adults. The Empress supported young directors at the Kanun, at times protecting them from censors and government bureaucrats. Kirastami was among several directors and filmmakers whose early careers benefited from her patronage. Later, the Kanun became their refuge during the dark years of the early revolutionary period. It left me wondering how many other young, countless young Iranians whose names we'll never know, but whose lives were forever changed by her leadership. Even though she's thousands of miles away from her country, she continues to be a source of light for Iran and a beacon of hope and inspiration for Iranians. I want to close by thanking you for your strength, for your resilience, for your humility, for your dignity, and your unwavering love for your people. You will forever be the queen of our hearts. Thank you. I hope that democracy will visit Iran one day and all the work that you have done from helping children, women, education, the arts, uh, leprosy, hospitals, uh, cinematography, everything else will blossom again and uh, Iran will be the country we used to know. At this time, we have, I have a small presentation to you. May I? I would like to read the message. Your Majesty, Empress Farah Pahlavi, we salute you for your lifelong commitments and achievements improving the lives of your people. Tota Family Foundation and your Washington DC friends, September 2017. So from all of us, this is to you as a memento of the evening. Annie, I don't know how to thank you for your friendship, for your kindness, and this tribute to me, and for having gathered such a wonderful people and friends. I could not have accomplished what I had done with the work I had to do for my country without the help of uh, many of my compatriots who participated and collaborated and tirelessly worked to make our dreams come true. I was blessed to have the support of my husband and also he always encouraged me in my endeavors. There were years of long years of long hours of hard work, uh, studying and planning and uh, to make many of our goals come to reality. I really am touched 
by your tribute and by your friendship, by your kindness. Everybody knows how gracious you are, your hospitality as a gracious hostess, but above all, we all know how your un untiring work for charitable and cultural organization. I wanted to give this tribute to so many more of my compatriots who worked uh, so hard to make a, the, a better life for people in Iran and who created so many facilities all around Iran. As you all know, Iran is a very thousands of years of culture and civilization. Iranian people want freedom, democracy, human right, a secular government, and the territorial integrity of their country. They want a government, they want a country to be friendly with our neighbors, with the rest of the world. In my country, light will overcome the darkness and Iran will rise from her ashes.